to do that. So I'll try to get gaming and gamification really quick. It'll be really fast, and we're going to get started since uh, we got a lot to cover. So my name is Scott Davis, and I am the CEO of Conquer. Uh, Conquer is a location-based mobile game. It's an MMO, massively multiplayer, and it is currently on the iPhone and the Windows phone. By the way, uh, before you laugh, we get four times more downloads on Windows phone than we get on iPhone. And our Android beta should be out before the end of this month. At least we're, we're hoping we'll have our Android out by the end of the month. Uh, if you have questions, do this. So go here, su submit your questions. I've, I'll be refreshing it on my phone here at the end. And um, you can submit questions this way through the, the Voice Hive app. And we'll, we'll see what we can get done at the end. Uh, like I said, this is an hour-long presentation that I'm going to really try to condense. And so I'm going to skip all the Conquer stuff. You guys don't care about blah, 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 Conquer. Um, we're going to talk about gaming. So let me skip through this standard stuff in the slide deck. And let's cut right into the meat of games and gamification. So when we talk about understanding gamers, uh, today we want to talk about what is a game, what motivates gamers, and what separates games from gamification. And so when we think about a game, the primary goal of a game is entertainment, right? I, I think that everybody can kind of agree to that's the purpose. And fun is the goal, but you know what? It takes a lot of work to have fun. World of Warcraft players, right? How much work is it to be good at World of Warcraft? I mean, it, it, um, even if you're a bridge player, I don't care what kind of game you're playing, for you to be good at what you do, basketball, golf, it takes a lot of work to be good at gaming. Um, on the other hand, when we talk about gamification, it's almost the exact same opposite thing. The primary goal of gamification is work, right? It's something that we have to do every day, um, and, and getting done with that work is the goal, but we want to try, we, we use gamification to actually make work fun. Uh, the things that we have to do all the time. How many people tried to potty train a kid or get them to eat their vegetables, right? And you gamify it. Um, things that have to be done, but we just want to make it fun. When we start thinking about gaming, um, we kind of have to understand what motivates gamers. And so I, it was in the early 90s, a guy named Richard Bartle created this, a white paper about gaming. And I think it was in around 96, some graduate students took it and created the Bartle Index. It's kind of like the Myers-Briggs of gaming. And when we think about when we game systems or we build games for ourselves, we really have to understand what drives gaming behavior. And so Bartle divided gamers into four categories. You have the killers. Um, represented by the clubs, because they run around, hit people on the head, and knock them out. Um, and killers aren't just people that are all blood and guts. Uh, killers can be the people that have to be the best. And some, a, a good example of a positive killer is someone who is the best person at taking them through the map and helping them um, in a multi massively multiplayer game, saying, go find this person. They're the wizard. They will teach you how to do blah, blah, blah. Um, and they're best known for whatever it is they're doing, not necessarily because they have the most frags. Um, achievers are represented by the diamonds. These are the treasure hunters. Uh, these are the people that will do anything for a Boy Scout badge. Um, anybody play Xbox Live and can't put the game away until they've gotten all the achievements? Uh, those are the achievers. Um, and socializers are the people that play because their friends play, probably because their friends made them play. Um, Socializers are, the best example I have is when grandma calls and says, why haven't you watered my strawberries today? Grandma, I haven't played Farmville in months, but I will log in and water your strawberries. Um, socializers create social contract, which extend engagement. And finally, we have the explorers represented by the, the spades, because they're constantly digging. Uh, Legend of Zelda players, Nintendo, how many people bombed every rock and burnt every bush? <laughs> you guys are explorers. Um, the explorers are the people that will do, they will go to the farthest reaches of a game map to try to figure out what's there. Um, in, in a business application, they'll want to look at every feature to make sure that they're not missing anything in whatever the product is that they bought and are using. Um, so here's a, a, a longer uh, explanation of the Bardo Quadrant. It's off of Wikipedia. Um, so there's some interesting stuff here with the interactions between these groups. You'll notice that killers interact with everybody because they kill them. <laughs> um, and so they kind of have to. But oddly enough, you'll see there's no circles here. Killers don't like to kill each other because those are the good players, right? Oh, I walk away, right? And that's kind of what happens with killers. 
Um, achievers and killers interact. Um, obviously, we already talked about why killers interact with them. But achievers interact with the killers because sometimes they have to become killers themselves or they need to interact with killers in order to get the achievements that they're trying to get. Um, socializers here obviously interact with each other. That's why they're all there. Um, and they'll interact with the killers a lot and with the achievers because those are the jocks. Everybody wants to hang out with the jocks and so, hey, I just met the number one person on the leaderboard for this or that and we talked for 10 minutes and, and then they had to go because they had to kill somebody. Um, and then finally we have explorers. Uh, the explorers generally don't interact around the board too much. They interact with each other in order to share tips and tricks about, hey, if you go to the farthest northwest corner of the map, you'll find the best gold deposits that'll give you the best exchange rates or whatever the case may be. The probably the most interesting part of this though is who's not interacting. Uh, explorers and achievers don't interact with each, with each other because explorers are like the minecrafters. They like to craft, they like to make things, and a lot of times they'll need the stuff that the achievers has found and the achievers are hoarders. They don't like to share. So these two groups generally don't interact. Um, I think the funniest one though is here on the bottom. The socializers and the, and the explorers are the most unusual group to try to interact with. Uh, the socializers, the explorers view the socializers as kind of the valley girl. You know, let's get together and have fun. And, and, and the socializers look at the explorers saying, why are you there? There's nobody there. Why would you go there? That's stupid. Um, and so these two groups don't interact because they have very different motives in playing a game. Um, when we look at the features that we can put into our game, and that's not a very good color scheme there, um, but we can look and we can see what are the features that we put into the game that will help each of these groups. You really want, when you build a game or when you gamify a system, you have to think about what am I putting in here? Naturally, as a game designer, you'll want to build things that resonate with you. I'm an explorer, but I need to make sure that I am satisfying other people. So killers, hass, rack, taunt, heckle, socializers help each other, they give comments, they like stuff, um, explorers like to explore, like to view, they, they want a map. They rate and review, they curate uh, content. And the achievers, they have to win, they have to ch have challenges. Uh, they like to compare stats with each other. This is what we do within Conquer. Every time we put up a feature saying, hey, we should think about doing this, we figure out who's it gonna satisfy. And we try to make sure that we put our features um, to cross the board. When you're thinking about gamifying a system, whether you're building a game or gamifying a system, this is really, really important to understand. How many people have a manager that manages here on the right? Sticks and carrots, right? If you do this, awesome stuff. If you don't get your time card in on time, what happens at three o'clock on Friday? Um, how many people get a phone call or an email or somebody walking around saying, did you get your time card in? Did you get your time card in? Those things like that. Um, but this is what really makes people want to use apps or really wants them to play games. It's love, it's the things that they care about. They give this sense of mastery, the sense of satisfaction. Um, I'm learning something. These are the things that you really want to pull forward in your apps and in your games to really, really ramp up engagement and retention. Um, well, we're gonna skip these mastery slides and the different levels of from novice to expert. Um, there, I'm gonna go back one slide though. There is an important concept um, that even apps, whether you're building apps or games, can build on here and that's the elder concept here. People will stick around in a game or using an app or go out on the forums and participate with your support forums, whether that's a game or an app, if they get the notoriety of their, they're the elder, they're the ninja, whatever it might be, they put in all this time and effort and potentially money to get to that stage. If they can stick around and have people kind of be in awe of them and what they've done, they will stick around longer. Um, think about ways that you can expose people as being an elder and give them the reputation that they're really looking for. Uh, Ralph Coster, I'll go back one more. Uh, Ralph Coster's got a good white paper that he had at GDC a couple years ago, and he claims that he's identified every single type of game. It's, an, it's a fun and interesting read. Um, might give you some exposure to some, to some new things that you hadn't thought of before. Just like with sales, if you're in sales, this is probably not a new chart for you. 
Um, but every game or get every application has this concept of the sales funnel or the acquisition funnel. You have acquisition in the apps world, they downloaded my app. Then you have retention. They've been playing my app for a while, and hopefully they're going to recruit some friends and you get a virality index, and your virality index gets you more acquisitions. Um, ideally, you want your virality index to be above one. So every person who's used your game or used your app has gotten one other person on average to go out and try it too. If you can do that, you've kind of got that perpetual engine of users and you're really looking at accelerating, not spending money um, to get more users. And then finally, you squeeze them down into monetization. What, how am I gonna get that one to 5% of my players to spend money on my game in order to, to make me profitable? Or same way with your app. By the way, this is somewhat uh, of an assumption here that you're using a freemium model. The freemium model is really the only way to build apps on the internet today, whether you're doing apps, you're doing Facebook games, you're doing mobile games, you're doing mobile apps, you really need to be looking at the freemium model. Um, depending on what you're looking at, whether you're looking at the marketplaces in Europe, Asia, uh, North America, looking at iPhone or Android, between 70 to 90% of the top grossing apps are doing freemium. And what freemium is, is that you can do, you can use the app for free, but if you're willing to spend a little money, you can get a premium experience, which is how the word freemium comes about. And the idea is it goes beyond trial. Give them something that they can do in the app that gives them value, that gets them hooked, and then entice them that if you just go to that, just pass that velvet rope one more level, if you're willing to spend some money, look at all the other things that you can do too. Uh, there's a, a good chart that I made for Conquer recently that I don't have up here, but it shows in Conquer how people spend money. And we, we have kind of a level zero through 100 is kind of our training level. And once you've gotten to level 100, you're a master. You've done everything. And now you can think of it as not really boot camp because it's longer than a boot camp. Um, but we looked at where people are spending money. And people spend more money at level 100 than they do at all the other levels combined. And I think what that shows is exactly what freemium is all about, is get them in there, get them addicted, get them hooked, get them to love whatever it is that you've built and then start asking them to spend money. Don't stop them from spending money early, but the important thing is that get them engaged in your product and then, and then try to get, entice them to spend money. I actually didn't expect that. That was a learning piece for me. Um, I kind of expected, as you probably might as well, that, well, you get to level 100, you're done, right? You've, you beat the game, you got to level 100. Um, and that's not what happened for Conquer. Um, for them, it was just kind of proving that now I'm here, I'm, I'm with the rest of the, the big boys that are in the game. And so um, get them in there and get them to love what you do. Um, so when we talk about gamification of business systems, which was one of the questions that was over here, um, we're really talking about motivating behavior through rewards, recognition, points, prestige. Um, this is LinkedIn. How many gamification things do we see on here? You know what, I'm going to make this easy so that we go fast. Um, connections, right? How many connections? Do you want to see who's viewed your profile? 95% profile completeness. Who could ever tolerate being that close to 100%? <laughs> um, add skills, and it's prompting me. What do I need to do? And who else has been doing stuff with skills in here? And um, look at, people love me. I have a little red five and a little red one up there. You know, it's that sense of, oh, somebody wants to talk to me. Um, those are great elements of gamification. Uh, Stack Overflow is probably one of the best examples I've seen online. This is John Sheehan, who used to live in Minneapolis, and he's uh, a very prominent speaker and evangelist around the world. 0.49% um, overall, top one half of 1%. Look at his reputation points. I don't even know what that means, but it's awesome, <laughs> right? Um, how long has he been a member? Look how many people have looked at his profile. Um, but here, it he gets even better than that. His badges, right? Look at all the badges he's got. He's got um, a tumbleweed, which I don't know what that means. It's cool. Um, he's got a yearling award. There's an excavator, uh, peer pressure award. Um, it doesn't matter, right? Because these are badges. These are cool things. Everybody wants a badge. They got recognition. This is Code Academy for teaching coding online. Um, look at the badges. Getting badges. Every time you complete a chapter, you get to tweet and post on Facebook, hey, I just completed this. I got my badge for best terrible JavaScript. Um, <laughs> um, 
Let's see if we're on the internet. This is a great example, and it's definitely worth a show if, if it comes up. Um, it's a great example of a gamify, gamifying an everyday problem in an unexpected way. Should have, a good presenter would have tested this ahead of time. I think it's going to work. Maybe. We'll give it. Yep, here we go. I think. No, it's not going to work. We're going to give up. We're going to punt and go forward. Uh, basically, what, we, what this is is that uh, Volkswagen had put to, out a contest to see um, how can we apply basically gaming to the real world. And a uh, gentleman had submitted uh, an idea. Where was I? A gentleman had submitted an idea of having a speed trap lottery. And so the speed trap lottery was that they put up a speed camera. Here we go. They put up a speed camera. And um, every time you go past a speed camera, if you were speeding, you'd get a ticket. If you weren't speeding, they'd take a picture of your driver's license, and you'd go in the lottery. And then every month, they'd draw a name, and you would get part of the speeding ticket money. And they had, now, this is kind of goes back to that stick and carrot thing, right? Everybody knows if you speed, you could get a ticket. And we all know about speeding cameras now. They reduced speeds from 35 kilometers an hour to 25 kilometers an hour in a, in a town in France through this game. And it, it, it positively encouraged people to slow down. And not only that, but they made more revenue, right? Because they put up a speed trap. Who knows what this is? Ford Focus. What's this little tree here for? The better you drive, the more leaves your tree has. <laughs> this has really, really, really changed driving habits of these car owners. How many people have a car that tells them how many miles per gallon they're getting? Right? It's not hard. It's data, right? We're all nerds. We get it. It's data. Now, I actually changed my driving habits when that happened. But then after a month or two, it kind of was like, well, it's always 30. You know, I don't, what do I care? Do you have a question? I don't know. I don't have a focus. Um, they do go away, though. And so, um, but the important thing here is we go back to the heart. Remember that slide with the heart, the love? I love my little tree. I need to protect my little tree. I am not going to stomp on the accelerator and knock leaves off my little tree. Um, this, this is such a simplistic idea, but it's so critical to the way we think. It affects our psyche, and we start thinking about what do we, how do we change behavior based on kind of, well, love? Um, you know, this is, a, I was looking for an example about a, an energy meter from a company in town here that I had heard, and I was searching the internet, and I found this instead. Um, the local company in town had a meter that you'd put by your garage door, and it would show you when you leave your house, uh, when you walk to your garage from your house, it would show what your current immediate energy usage was, and the idea was to get you to go back and turn lights off. Um, and so you'd see what you were using. And they started with numbers. They started with like an A through F grading cycle. And it wasn't until they just went to very simple, simple uh, green, yellow, orange, red, that they really started to see behavior. Because nobody could leave the house if it was red. <laughs> Why is it red? I need to go back and turn off whatever it is that's making it red so I can get out the door. Um, but today, if it was a dollar sign saying, hey, right now you, you're using 50 cents an hour, well, I care. I'm late. I got to go. But if it's red, I'm going to turn around and I'm going to go back and fix it. Um, this was an example of an orb that you can hook up to any data source. And in California, energy rates change literally by the minute. And so what you pay for electricity um, is really based on demand. And so they had hooked this up to the energy, um, the cost, real-time cost, and they put these on people's kitchen counters. And as soon as people would see that their orb had changed to a darker color or red or something, they'd start running around and turning things off. It seems 40% energy reduction in the people that had this in their home. Um, now, you could have done that with a text message. You could have done that with an email. You could have done that with something else. But I will say that it's because it's a little egg and it's green. And we want to keep our little egg green. <laughs> Credit card points have been doing this for a long time. This is both a ranking and a prestige level. Um, check this out. This is an energy bill. Now, maybe you need 15 monitors to be running your World of Warcraft, and you just absolutely, there's nothing you can do about this, because it's really important to have those 15 monitors while you're sitting in your 12-person hot tub. But um, this gives you an idea of how you compare to the people around you. This isn't just the average. 
These are the people around you, your neighbors, love, the people you like, the people you hang out with, and look how terrible you are. <laughs> now, you might know that the, the people in the green, those are the hippie Amish people up the street, and they never use any electricity, and they're always cooking outside on a campfire in January, but um, at least you can see where you are compared to the average, and maybe, just maybe, you can say, you know what, this month I'm going to be the green bar. <laughs> the grow house. That's why the neighbors are green. Oh, okay. I don't know if you're going to mention this, but uh, one thing about this um, that, that they also found out is that if you find that you are performing better than your neighbors, you'll actually start using more electricity. And in aggregate, it'll go up. So the low people will start coming up. Is that what you're saying? That's what I'm saying. You don't so get the low people to. The um, there was a. <laughs> There was an electric company in northern Minnesota. I found, did find research on this. They, had, they didn't do the bars. They just did, if you were doing bad, they put a frowny face on your bill. <laughs> and um, they had to stop. They got so many complaints from their customers, they had to take it off. But again, that's the stick, right? Nobody performs to the stick. Tell them where they need to go or where other, not even where they need to go. Tell them what other people are doing, and they'll want to do better. And so that's a subtle but important difference. Um, when we think about gaming and management, um, how many people have worked 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock at night, Saturday, send an email? Did you send an email to your boss about something completely unrelated so they knew you were there? <laughs> right? Um, when I got out of college, I, one of the mistakes I made as a, a young professional is I would get into work at 6.30 in the morning and I'd leave at 4 o'clock. And it was fine. I got, you know, it didn't matter as long as you put your time in. How many people saw me get in the door at 6.30 in the morning? How many people saw me walk out the door every day at 4 o'clock? That's a bad problem, right? You have, that's a perception problem that's kind of a game mechanic. Um, now, if your boss is a, is a good boss, he'll know when you're working. He'll know that you work early. He'll be watching the time cards. Um, and they'll do a better job of, of maintaining um, what's happening, especially when you're still there at 6 or 7 o'clock at night during a big project. Everybody else is there at 6 or 7 o'clock, too, but you got in three hours before everybody else. Um, wouldn't you like some recognition for that? Is it a demotivator if you don't get recognized for things like that? Recognition really moves the needle for people. It doesn't matter. It, it, and what a lot of managers will do is they'll say, you know, you worked 80 hours a week for three months. That's fantastic. This project succeeded because of you. Here's a $25 gift card. Please go take your wife or your husband out to dinner. <laughs> now, wait a minute. I worked about 250 extra hours. You gave me 25 bucks. So my time to you is worth a dollar an hour. Um, it sounds really counterintuitive, but it actually demotivates people when you start doing monetary stuff for things like that. Instead, how cool it would be to be awarded a mountain bike during a company meeting. Or just an email every week saying, hey, if you ever see Joe in the hallway, ask him if he even remembers what his kid looks like because he's the only reason why this project is still working and he's here every minute of the day. Now, when your peer comes up to you and says, dude, how in the world are you doing this? I can't believe it. Thank you for being the person that can step up and take care of this. That means a lot. It, it will motivate people to get recognition um, simply just by doing that than trying to set up monetary awards. Um, there's this, nah, I'm going to skip the rest of this. We need to move. Um, so there we go. So that's kind of gamification. How do we change behavior? We look at rewards. We look at recognition. We look at uh, tracking. You have to track stuff. You have to track stuff. How many people like their time card system? When I interview a job, when I, when I, back when I actually used to look for jobs, I, one of the things I'd ask the company is, what's your time card system look like? Um, it tells you a lot about how people re uh, think about their employee contributions if they don't let you write down all the time you work. It doesn't matter if you don't get paid for it, but I want people to know how much I'm contributing to the company's success. Um, heck, you know, someday when Conquer's big enough, I'd like to have a time card system where if somebody wants to put in the fact that they're reading a management book or getting a certification or church council treasurer or Boy Scout leader, I mean, those are important things to me as a, as a leader in a company. I want to know who's putting in extra time, not just in work, but out of work. If they're willing to share it, why not let them brag about it and then try to recognize them for it? OK, so when I gave this talk at the U of M at Code Camp last year, uh, a bright young man said, OK, fine, you've convinced me I should gamify stuff, but why shouldn't? Tell me when I shouldn't. 
Well, this is the answer. Anything you gamify will be gamed. Um, you will change behavior, and you may not like it. Um, how many people in sales? OK, good. Um, oh, sorry. <laughs> I saw you too late. Um, so if you've worked with a salesperson, you probably know that you won't get them to do anything unless you put it in their comp plan. Um, salespeople, great people, a lot of sales friends, but they've been so well trained that they won't do things unless it's part of their comp plan. You ask somebody, hey, who knows the CRM system well enough to train the new guy? That's not my job description. I'm not doing that. Um, you're not paying. That's not my job. You're not paying me for that. And that's a good example of if you train people to do things based on incentives, they, won't, they may not do anything else but what you've incentivized them to do. So it's not as easy as I made it sound. You really have to think strategically about what do we need to try to get our customers, our employees, to improve, but what could be the consequences and what do we not want to go down that we like where it's already at. Um, you have to, you know, we, I said in the earlier slide, you know, measure, track. That doesn't, a lot of times people are tracking things that are not the right things to track, they're just easy to track. How many people would pay a developer based on lines of code written? <laughs> right, it's easy to track, um, but that doesn't mean it's the right way to reward people. Just because we can track something doesn't mean that that should be part of a metric that we're going to use in, in any type of a rewards or incentive system. Um, realistically, the world is a game today. Everything is a game in this world. Who had the best vacation? Facebook knows. <laughs> Who has the smartest kids, best athletes? Facebook knows, right? We've gamified everything. Everything in our lives has got some measure to it. Whether we think about it or not, um, you know, who goes to the church the most? Who has the best, you know, who, who volunteers the most? Um, things like that. If, if you say, you know, I'm not going to do that, you're, you're, pro you're already participating in the game. It's just a matter of whether you want to be there or not. So let's gamify minibar. <laughs> the most tweets for the best speaker. Tweet this right now. <laughs> um, even I, you know, we. As speakers here, we all have a little friendly competition with each other. We try to keep our ears open for uh, who had the best session or who, what session people are talking about. Um, so anyway, Scott K. Davis, if you are willing to play the game. OK, so uh, I've got some other stuff. I think we did a pretty good job here. We've got about 10 minutes to take kind of general Q&A, and I can go back here and get through some of the conquer stuff. Um, since we do have some time, I'll, I'll give you some of the original kind of Let's do smarter about this instead of just go back, back, back. Um, so this is the Conquer team. We came out of Startup Weekend in 2010. We won the first Startup Weekend in 2010. And uh, we have a team of seven equity founders. These are people that did work on the product before it was actually released. Everybody who's done work since then has been paid um, through either real cash or a debt vehicle that then was recently paid off in real cash. Um, our game is, is kind of like the board game Risk, but on the map of the real world, the idea is that you use your mobile phone to capture and control the cities where you live, work, and play. And so you deploy robotic soldiers, nanobots, um, from your phone to take over the towns and then protect it from the enemy. Um, we released our first version last March. We had a beta before that. So in about a year, our players have captured a quarter of a million cities in 157 countries. Um, our servers get a little over two to maybe 2.5 million hits a week um, from our API, from our clients. We get uh, about 40 downloads a day out of the iPhone store and about 400 a day out of the Windows Phone store. Uh, I can, if you guys have a question about how that could possibly be true, I can help you with that a little bit later on the QA part. Um, this is kind of the premise that we build off of. Uh, this is Sasha Pulsika. She's a TED speaker, and we met her at South by Southwest. And the very first thing she said when she came up to us uh, I have never spent a dime on a game in my phone, but I swear I'll spend whatever the hell it takes to defend my hometown from anyone who tries to take it away from me. Um, in gaming, whether you're building games or you're building game systems, you need to build gamer passion. That's what drives engagement in your game. Now, nobody had passion for throwing birds at pigs. That had to be manufactured, right? That, that has something that had to be created. But in our game, we try to take passion that people already have. Passion for your hometown, where you went to school, where you grew up, where your kid plays basketball. Um, these are things that we're very passionate about in our life, and we bring that into the game. 
Now, there's not a lot of things that you can do like that in the real world. Sports are very cyclical. They only run for about half the year. Politics is a very dangerous place to build a game. Um, you can build a game for your industry if you're passionate about healthcare or manufacturing. But again, it's a very kind of a niche thing. And so we've selected this, Pride in Your Hometown, as a way to kind of bring that passion in the game so that we wouldn't have to build it. You want to make somebody mad, insult their hometown. It's true. Um, and give them a, to a story to tell. Uh, we have so many epic stories of our gamers who are going, who are taking an hour-long trip, well, one, of, one of our gamers, from Austin to Waco. Hour and 10-minute trip, took them four and a half hours because they took every little back road they could to capture every little town on the way there. <laughs> um, we've, got, we've got gamers, uh, Portland and Salem, launching missiles at uh, each other all the time. Uh, midnight, uh, McPone and Ponestris are midnight in the fog. It's on the, it's on the West Coast, right? And it's up there in Portland. Driving all these little towns, sneaking in on Sna Salem, set up shop in a Denny's and launch $100 worth of missiles in one night and wipe out Salem. Um, <laughs> build a story. It doesn't matter if you're building a game or you're building a product. Give a story because me, as an entrepreneur, you want to be able to tell your story so people get excited about it, but you want to tell a story other people want to tell for you, right? That's kind of that PR piece. That's that organic, virality, social, spread the word thing. What is your story? A lot of entrepreneurs will start off with what is the business problem they're trying to solve. We've been trained. What's the business problem you're trying to solve? You know, and then we start spitting out things like synergy and all that garbage. <laughs> tell a story. Tell a story that people will say, what, really? And you're not going to believe what I just heard. You know, and then that, that goes farther. Um, when, you're, when you're gamifying a system, that's an easy thing to make something fun, or when you're building a game itself. Um, yeah. And, and in our game, we try to build a believable story. An artificial intelligence really could have taken over the internet, and only a few people may have figured it out. Um, we try to bring that reality into the game, because it makes a better story, not only for us when we're selling Conquer, or pitching Conquer. Um, but when our users are telling their friends about it, too. Okay, so 10-minute Q&A, perfect. What do you guys want to know? Let me look at the, the list of what you guys have submitted. How do you determine rewards, achieve the desired behaviors you want from your audience or users, any tools, sources of info from doing that, anonymous? Okay, so... Um, I had a question earlier about what tools do we implement for our gaming platform, and the answer is really we haven't used any. Uh, I've been burned a lot in the past by implementing tools and come to find out the implementation took as long as it would take to build from scratch, and then I'm kind of stuck because I can't extend it. Um, sometimes the implementation is a black box, and as a nerd, data is gold, and if I can't get to the data of what people are doing inside this black box, then that's a bad deal. Um, we have a lot of data. We have 3 million battle zones. We've had... Um, I think I mentioned 2.5, or yeah, a quarter of a million cities captured. Uh, we get 73,000 launches. Is it a day? I think it's 73,000 launches a day. People launch battles. And so we have a, a lot of data. And for me, it's really important to be able to slice and dice through all my data. Um, build versus buy is always a tricky question. I tend to be on the build side, which is definitely not the right answer for everybody. And I don't advocate that you should always build custom and you should buy when you can. You have to decide what's the right choice for you. Um, the important thing is, is to have the skill and have the access to the data. If, if you have the data and you, you don't have the skill or somebody in your team needs to build that skill, look at your data. Watch your data. Um, data will drive uh, the numbers you have. Um, in terms of rewards, uh, we do have an achievement model in Conquer. We have kind of a dual layered achievement model. You can earn badges. Uh, in the game for doing certain things, and then badges get you rank points, and then you rank up from private up to master sergeant right now. We haven't gone to the NCO ranks yet. Um, and so we try to figure out what do we want people to do. Uh, we never want to reward people for spending money, because that's a bad thing in gaming. Gamers don't like that. Um, but we reward people for having all of their upgrades. <coughs> now, you can earn all your upgrades if you play for three months or so, um, but a lot of people are just buying their upgrades. and so. Um, incentivize around the edges of the behavior you want um, and, or, or directly on the behavior you want, depending on what the right, the right approach is for you. There really isn't a right answer there. Let's see what this next question is, and then we can come back to that if it needs to be cleared up. 
You've clearly spent time experimenting with gamification in your management expertise. What are some of your most successful examples and horror stories? Okay, um, the best example I have for kind of gamifying as a manager is, uh, and it kind of goes back to some of the PR stuff, a tell a story, is when I, I, at one point in my career as the district manager, I had 50 direct reports and none of them were in my office. They were all consultants. It's really hard to manage 50 people. It's worse when you never get to see any of them. And so um, it was also part of an acquisition. Culture was failing. People were leaving left and right. And it was a really hard environment to be in. Every Sunday night, religiously, I would type a state of the practice email. And I would send it out to all my staff. And I used the um, um, Dale Carnegie principles of communication. Now, Dale Carnegie wrote his books, Winning Friends and Influencing People, in the 40s. But it's amazing how much it applies to email communication. Start off positive, identify the problem, but never use you. Uh, always use we or us. We've done something. We found this. Ask for help in solving the problem, even if they're the cause of the problem. And then close with something positive. And so what I would do in my email is I would always start off with, we had a good week this week, blah, blah, blah. Um, in the middle, I'd talk about people leaving the company. No one ever talked about people leaving the company, which made people really furious when they'd send an email to their friend and realize that they were not there anymore. Um, you know, you'd call out the problems with the time card system this or the expense system that and with the whole integration of the three companies together. And then you'd close off. And I, I did exactly what I said about if you ever see Joe walk down the hallway, ask him if you know what his kids look like. Um, make sure to give um, Steve a pat on the back because he just saved this big project. Um, so and so brought in a, a recruitment of a friend. Um, really good to have more people bringing resources into the company in these troubling times, blah, blah, blah. Um, always call out the positive in management and recognize people for the things that they're doing well. Um, when someone's having a problem of don't get your time cards in on time, a bad manager will list out the four people that didn't get their time cards in on time. A good manager will say, look, I know some people are having some trouble. Let me know if you need anything. I know who you are, but um, so if you need some help or if something's not set up right, let me know. Almost always with time card problems, it was because somebody else the salesperson typically did not activate the code. That's why their time card wasn't in time. When you blame somebody for a problem and they're not actually the root cause, it makes it so much worse. Ask for help. What's going on? What's not working? Let me know so I can fix it. And it's like, no, no, don't worry about it. It was my problem. I'll take care of it. Um, when you approach things positively, it, it helps a lot. Um, horror stories. <sighs> I think you know the examples that I've seen um, is really when you try to reward people with, with money and you can't reward up to the level that is really commiserate with their salary. It's just never going to work. And it just accelerates out of control. Um, and so I, I think that in management, trying to recognize rather than reward is, is generally a better policy. Pay people something fair, but reward them for their bonuses. New car, well, that might set a bad precedent. Yeah. Um, it, <clears throat> it's tricky. It's really tricky. Um, you know, there's no right or wrong way to do it with management. Find out what people want. When I was a consultant, I always used to tell people, you know, don't be a contractor, be a consultant. Consultants solve problems. Contractors sit and crank code. Be a consultant. What is the problem? And let's move forward. Um, you guys have all worked with people that had weird personalities. We're nerds, OK? We're a tough group of people to work with. Some people in the room always have to be right. Some people in the room always have to have their opinion heard. Some people in the room have to always point out the problems. Um, some people in the room, I don't know, what's left, right? All the bad things that we are as nerds, right? Somebody needs to be right, let them be right. Point out the problem. Ask questions instead of saying, when I was a consultant, nobody ever hires a consultant because things are going well. Right? And nobody wants you to come into their environment and say, hey, I've got the answer. Um, I might know what the answer is for the solution, but I would never tell anybody. I'd ask them leading questions to lead them to my solution. But maybe we don't actually get to my solution. Maybe we get to something better, which is perfect. Let's do that. But I always gave away the credit. Always give people the credit saying, hey, you know, I was thinking about this, and I have no idea if this is going to work. What if we did this? you know what, that's not a bad idea. If we went and did that, then we could do this. I'd say, I like your idea. It's my idea. I gave away the credit, right? All I care about is the thing gets done. I don't care about anything else. And as a manager, let, let everybody else have the credit. 
What else? Other questions? That was it for this thing. Yep. Console gamers, console gamers are really upset right now about freemium coming into the console gaming. Yeah, how do you like overcome issues like that? Like the the important thing with freemium is that you try it depends on your what you're trying to do, but in Conquer, we try to avoid creating a pay to pay to win scenario. Everything we you do in Conquer, you can do for free. Um, you, you don't, gamers get really upset when you are into the game and you reach a level where you can't even get to the next level without spending money. Um, that becomes a problem. Don't make it impossible. Just make it, you know, re say, hey, you know, you want to play for free? That's cool. We put a lot of time into this, but you're going to have to work your butt off to get to that next level. Um, you want to spend five bucks or two bucks or whatever it is, then we'll just give you that next level and you can go forward. And so you really have, I mean, it's a lot of trial and error. There's no right answer. Game mechanics are really, really tough to do. Game design's a hard thing to do. Um, but try to avoid making a, a pay-to-play scenario unless you really don't want any freeloaders. Um, and then you've got to protect your brand, right? Because the freeloaders um, will, will hurt your brand. Um, by the way, speaking of free <laughs> hurting your brand, so in the Windows Phone marketplace in the early days before our game had a lot of features, because we're entrepreneurs, we launch early and we launch messy, uh, we get a one-star review in the Windows Phone Marketplace and say, yeah, it wasn't for me or not ready yet or these guys need to make some improvements. Um, when we get a one-star review in the Apple Marketplace, we get a thesis about why we suck. Um, <laughs> and so, you know, watch your audience too. Steve Jobs taught a lot of people that they should expect perfection, and when they don't get it, they should nail them to the wall. And so you have to know your environment that you're going into as well because that hurts your brand. Um, all the reasons why you should never, ever, ever, ever download this thing that's free. Um, that hurts your brand. But you, so you have to know your environment, too. Is there certain areas where you would recommend not using the workstation for the It depends on how deeply you go. I mean, you, you always have to know what the behavior is that you're, the, what you're incentivizing. Um, anything around banking, and I mean, when there's real money, cash involved, um, when there's real reputation in the real world, a lot of those things can be a scary place to do anything serious with gaming because you have the, the point of hurting people emotionally or physically um, or, or creating a financial problem. And so um, we try not, we don't want to be a casino. We don't want to create such an addictive thing that we just try to squeeze every cent out of people. In fact, I think I'm, I'm thinking about putting in gamer limits because I have players that have spent over $1,000 in my free game. Um, and so I'm, I'm thinking about putting in kind of volunteer spending limits, so please don't let me. I had one person say, I uninstalled it from my phone, but I know that's not going to be enough. Can you please delete my account? Um, I said, yeah, absolutely. I don't, I don't want to create a problem. He was a very addictive personality. He thought, I thought this would be a casual game, and it's not, and I can't take it. Um, <laughs> so, um, you know, you have, to, you have to know your audience, and you have to test, and, and think, be cautious about it, I guess. Anything else? We're, we're over time, so if you have any questions, um, Scott K. Davis is my Twitter. You can find me out front. And I've got another session on gamifying your equity model next um, someplace else. So thank you very much.